everybody. Welcome um, from both London and New York. Uh, we're very excited. This is the second of our summer series. We're joined to London and New York Enterprise Tech Meetups. Huge thank you to John, Jess and Kira from the Workbench team for collaborating on this with us. Um, we're very excited today to be welcoming Daniel Deans, who's the founder and CEO of UiPath. We'll get to that later on. He's going to join us for a fireside chat. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors on the London side. So Auric, the FinTech Innovation Lab, IOCO Technology and Tailored Brands. And to kick this evening off, I'd like to welcome Megan Neal, who is the COO of Limitless Technology. So Megan, if you'd like to join us, you're gonna be our demo presenter to start this evening. Lovely, thank you very much, Ian. Wonderful to be here. Thank you very much um, with, uh, uh, inviting me to join. So I'm just going to share my screen and we will get started. Yeah, I can see it coming up. Perfect. Wonderful. So just start off with a little bit of context uh, before we dive into what is Limitless. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but around 60 million um, independent workers are already in existence in the USA, representing around $1.5 trillion worth of uh, US GDP. And there are predictions in place that by 2030, uh, nearly 50% of the workforce in the US will be engaged in the gig economy in some way, shape or form. So um, I think it's clear to say that the gig economy represents a massive trend for organizations to find better and different ways to engage with the talent that they will so desperately need to stay competitive in the sectors that they are in. That's the backdrop to why we founded Limitless back in 2016. Uh, I founded it with my business partner, Roger, um, who I've had the pleasure of working with for the last 20 years. Uh, we actually have a, a significant background in customer service and running and operating large scale contact centers for many, many multinational global organizations worldwide. We're VC backed. Uh, we've closed our Series B round uh, end of last year. We have some amazing VCs in our portfolio, um, Downing, Albion, and, and most recently Redline Capital. We have some amazing uh, strategic investors as well. Unilever Ventures invested in us and actually Genesis, uh, the leading contact center technology platform worldwide uh, took part in our last round and, and some incredible angels, uh, notably um, the ex-CFO of Salesforce, uh, ex-CMO of Unilever and a number of others. We're headquartered in uh, London, we have around 50 people, but we actually have, uh, we're a global team. So we have our go-to-market team based in the US um, part of our growth is that I'll be moving to the US as, as a founder, uh, as we've now taken on our latest series of funding. Uh, we have our technology team based in India and some of our client services teams based out of Eastern Europe as well. So truly global. And on top of that, we have our gig economy network, which is around 5,000 strong already, covering 34 countries and 56 languages. And we have a really, really simple mission it's to empower anyone on the planet to earn money for providing brilliant customer service for brands that they love. So we quite simply want to turn customer service on its head and create an incredible environment for people to provide brilliant service anytime and earn money for doing that. So what's gig CX? That's the term that we have given what we've done. We've created a new category within the customer service space and we've built a platform to support the gig economy part of it. Effectively, it means that we uh, invite expert users onto our platform, and these are people that love the brands that they support, not a normal call center agent who has to be trained on brand. These are people who use this, the products every day, and they have to also prove and through our platform and qualify to make sure that they have the right skills. They are freelancers. They are part of the gig economy. They sign up to very strict terms and conditions in whatever local jurisdiction that they're in. And they are paid per task. They sign up with PayPal and that's how they get rewarded on a per result case basis through the platform. And of course, our platform that we've built connects to any CRM or CX platform. We really are making sure that there is a single view of the customer. Nothing is ever in a silo. We support both digital and telephony channels and the platform does all of the heavy lifting. It manages all of the aspects of quality that you would want to ensure in terms of customer service and most importantly, compliance and security as well. These are some of the benefits. Why would someone move to GigCX? Well, tapping into better talent is going to be a consistent challenge moving forward and having the global workforce at your fingertips via a gig economy platform for customer service 
means that's an incredible benefit. Better customer experience, people are providing um, first-hand experience of working with a product and using a product to help others get better value from it. It's of course cheaper, lots of benefits of the gig economy reduce the overhead costs and some of the lost and unproductive time. And most importantly, I think it provides a much more flexible and agile resource pool that any organization can tap into. We're lucky that we've been doing this now for five years, having founded it in 2016, and we're working with some incredible brands that you can see there. Some of these are pioneers in the gig CX space, and some are now taking it to the next level, which is a phenomenal opportunity. So I'm now going to move swiftly into a quick demo to show you a small snapshot of the experience. There's really so much to show you, um, but hopefully this will help bring it to life for you. Um, what you see here in front of you is a, um, a mock-up of a customer, so typical customer support page that you would see if perhaps you were a Microsoft customer, one of our clients. Um, you'll see here that there are a number of support options, whether call me back, chat, or ask the community. And we've inserted this one here, which is the limitless proposition. So messaging a customer expert. You'll see we've also got um, the option down here. I'm now just going to uh, act as if I am a customer and submit a ticket that will then get passed through into the limitless platform to be answered by an expert. And I'll play the role of both. So here you'll see some simple coaching screens just to explain the type of channel that this is. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and answer the question. So I'm going to be Margaret. If I could spell, I need to put my email in. And I'm just got a very simple question. And submit my question. What that does now is that actually submits that ticket into the Limitless platform through an integration typically with our clients' uh, CRM platforms, whether that's Salesforce or Zendesk, et cetera. I'm now going to log in as the expert. Um, here you'll see I've got a num number of options available to me, but let me just log in to the expert web app. And here what you'll see is um, the interface that the experts use. I'm actually just being presented with an announcement that tells me that another customer I helped earlier in the day was really, really happy with the, um, the support that I gave them. So that gives me a nice pat on the back to continue to provide brilliant experience. Um, and see, here you see now we have a number of tickets in my dashboard for me to handle. Up here on the right are my kind of gig economy metrics. I have 100,000 points, which is the activity I've done on the platform and dictates my privileges. Here is my balance. I can check out at any time with PayPal. And here is my all important expert rating that I need to maintain at all times. So the platform uses a combination of reputation, gamification, and um, sophisticated AI routing to make sure that I'm always presented with the tasks that I can do really, really well at. We have a number of other features here on the left, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to pick this bottom one, which is the one that's just popped into my, uh, my platform. You can see it's worth $1.50 and 100 points. I'm now going to claim it. And you can see that actually the AI, which we built into the platform is suggesting an answer to me. So I'm just going to select that AI. I can also dip into the knowledge base here, which will help me um, answer the question if I need some extra information. Uh, in the interest of time, I am just going to send that answer back, which will pop back up into the customer interface here. I can reply. Um, and then I'll just close that case off so you can see how simple that is. And send that answer. Close the conversation, classify the question. So all the data is nice and neatly wrapped up in the client's Salesforce or CRM system. Finish that inquiry. And then all importantly, the customer now gets given an option to rate the experience, much like you would rate your Uber driver and provide some amazing feedback, which will go straight back to the expert. Uh, oh dear, so sorry. <laughs> and that concludes 
a very simple demo of the Limitless platform and summary of our uh, proposition. Great, thank you, Megan. We have a couple of questions coming in from the audience. So we've, hmm. I'll start with one from John, who's asking, are you using any particular conversational AI technology or is it your own? Uh, so we uh, are very happy to have that conversation. We've got a range, actually. We've built the plug. We work with enterprise, as you saw. So uh, quite often we will uh, plug in um, uh, the, the enterprise AI capability. We do have our own AI capability, and we also work with Google. Perfect. And then there's a couple of other questions coming in. So do you see the gig workers doing this full time or only part time? So is it something that you think you'll find sort of professionalizing over time is kind of the question, I think. So our model, yeah, our model is very much about part-time top-up income. Um, that's where we feel that we get the best of everybody, right? You, people are their best when they don't do things all the time. And that's certainly our experience from running a contact center for 20 plus years. So do a little bit and often rather than uh, constant. And are there any incentives to in, in maintaining a high rating aside from being able to keep your job? So that's from uh, yes, Pete. yeah. Well, the incentives are it is gamified, so there's often bonuses and games and, and competitions through the platform, um, and also the um, uh, the routing uh, engine effectively uh, will route and prioritize based on your activity levels and expert rating. Okay, cool. That kind of kills off. There was a question from Julian as well asking about the complexity of tasks. So that's sort of it. Sounds like it's done on an expert level. So yeah, we have different uh, two different levels of expert, qualified and certified. If you're certified, you've been through additional checks, which means you can handle um, much more complex tasks and also access different systems. And one last question then came in from, from John at Workbench, who was asking, what prompted you to move to New York? It sounds like it's a, a good story that they're excited you're going to be there soon. Yeah, so actually we're building, uh, setting up our hub in Austin, Texas. So I'll be splitting my time between West Coast and Austin as we do that. Ah, so they can't tempt you to New York. You might, you might, you might no, yeah, you never know. Happy to spend as much time there. Uh, it's it's one of my favorite places. Cool, excellent. No, that's great. Thank you so much for doing the uh, the presentation, Megan. It was very interesting. Um, anyone who's seen my uh, LinkedIn this week will know I am beyond excited to to welcome Daniel Deans to speak with us this evening. Um, you know, Daniel is UiPath is one of Europe's most exciting. Uh, tech companies, and it's great that he's coming to join us to talk about the, the history and everything with us. Um, I'm very grateful as well to Diane Brady, who's going to um, come to join us. She's from Forbes magazine, and she's going to moderate the uh, the uh, Farside chat for us. So I'll pass straight over to Diane. We want to get as many questions in as possible. So Diane, over to you. Great. Thank you, Ian. And of course, yes, welcome, Megan. Uh, lots of things to suggest when you get to New York. Daniel, I'm very excited by this conversation, and I have to be honest in my due diligence, um, reading a piece by my colleague, Alex Conrad, I noticed that you said you wanted to be an author uh, when you grew up, which makes my heart leap. Obviously that's not the direction you took, but why? Why was that something that intrigued you early on? Hi, Diane. Hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity for me to be here. Uh, and uh, this is a great way to start the conversation. You know, I uh, uh, when I was like 13, I uh, I had uh, an accident and I had to stay in bed like for two weeks. So a friend of mine sent me a great book. It's an American author. His name is uh, Jack London, mm. and uh, the book is called Martin Eden. So it was a, it was really a, uh, a book about uh, you know a talented young guy you know, coming out of really poor meanings. He was a sailor and uh, he fell in love with uh, a woman and he thought that his way to her heart was to become a writer. And the book is really about uh, his journey, his uh, learnings and, uh, you know, some at some point in that book, he, he learned like the writers are the titans of the humankind somehow. And I, I feel it resonates very well with me. And uh, I- To be a titan of humankind, is that was the inspiration? Yes, yes, yes. For a, for a 13 year old kid, of course, that was a, a big one. And uh, that, that kind of uh, fired up my uh, passion for reading first. And uh, reading, I, 
attribute a lot of my later what what I've become at a later stage to my uh, to my readings. And I, I know I think nowadays, especially reading fiction in particular, it's uh, really not so common. But I believe that for entrepreneurs, especially, it's uh, an uh, essential way to train yourself to become a better entrepreneur. And why so? As an entrepreneur, you will have to lead people and you will have to lead larger and larger teams. Fiction is a way to get way more depth into the human soul, into how, th how humans are, how different they are. You get a bit of perspective on the history. You will see that what you are living now, it's not necessarily unique. Many other folks have lived the same kind of challenges, the passions, the interactions with human, the connections, hate, love, everything. And in building a company, you will meet all of these challenges. So before we move on from that, because I think it's fascinating, any great books that you would suggest the, uh, the collection of what you you mentioned the one at 13. I don't know if there's anything you're reading at the moment or any ones that you think are especially powerful for this group of entrepreneurs. So what I am reading right now, it's a, it, it's a rather lengthy book. So it, I took a lot of courage to start reading it. War and Peace. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, similar uh, <laughs> thick <laughs> as uh, War and Peace. It's called uh, Magic Mountain. Ah. The, the author is uh, Thomas Mann. And it's really a great book about, it's, it's a great introspection into, again, you know, human soul. And it, it also taps uh, quite a bit into something that we experience quite a lot nowadays. It's a great discussion between uh, progress and uh, conservatism. So we have good arguments on both sides. So it, it's something that, uh, of course, you don't have to get an accident to start reading it. No, but... you, you definitely don't. And I know that, you know, obviously, we know the path you took did take you to software engineering and going to Microsoft and then, you know, um, starting company number one, which we want to talk about. One of the things before we get into that is, we're so far removed now from the term uh, communist Romania that I think people forget a little bit about what that was like. And I'm just curious, you know, you had you were exposed to it for 17 years of your life. How did that tell us? Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like and how that shaped your sort of view of the company and your leadership as well? Well, the communist uh, Romania came with uh many bad things and a few good things. So I'll start with the negative. What, what kind of a communist society, it's not communist ideology, but it's the society and how the leaders, you know, kind of trapped people. They use a very simple technique to turn the truth into, into lie. It was extreme. So people got used to watch one to each other, you know, seeing each other in their eyes and lying. Everybody knew it was a lie. But I think this kind of deeply affect uh, the fabric of this, how society works. So we have uh, therefore developed an extremely good bullshit radar. <laughs> it's very difficult to, you know, to get out uh, in, in Romania. And I think I, I, I've seen this with many of my Eastern European friends. It's very difficult to get with, with this more like uh, American-like messages. We are great, let's go, let's do it, let's, which is bad because in a way we, we've built this, uh, uh, this bullshit uh, shield, but this shield shields us also for, from greatness. If you don't believe in people's good willing and the good in this world, you are not going to do anything, basically. Well, it's interesting because now you've got basically two homes, New York City and Bucharest, right? The two main homes for UiPath. 
is that a way to get the best of both worlds? Well, I, uh, I think so. And it's not only these two. I, I was a traveler of the world in the past few years until the pandemic hit. I, I love many cities. London is one of my favorite. Paris, Tokyo, it's, uh, it's absolutely beautiful. To me, it's a, it's a fun that seeing different cultures, it's a, an amazing opportunity to also grow as, as an individual. But again, for a company that has global aspiration, it's also very important to avoid be, b- building this monocolor culture. Mm-hmm. I, I said many times to this company, guys, we are not a Romanian company, we are not an American company, we are a global company. We are very inclusive and we, we were able to build this company that fast, particularly because we tap talent across all the world. I've seen many companies and many startups that tend to hire people only within their close circle, only from a particular country or a particular university. This is not, this doesn't have the power to scale fast and it's going to limit you. Yeah, and, and hyper growth is one of the, is, is the theme of this conversation. It's certainly something that you've experienced. I'm curious about the aha moment that took you to UiPath. What initially motivated you to start your own business, it seems, was outsourcing. Is that correct? Can, can you give us a little bit of a walkthrough as to how, you know, what was the revelation that brought you to where this company is and, you know, what it was that differentiated you really in the market? Well, I think I turned my desire to be a writer after I failed writing. I realized <laughs> I have no talent for it. <laughs> But the you desire, did okay. <laughs> well, I'm an email writer right now. But the desire to build stayed with me. And, uh, you know, I, I left a pretty good life in Microsoft in Seattle to, to build something out of nowhere. I know that now everybody uh, would say this, that was the best decision of my life, but uh, I think it was the worst in many in many respects because I jumped into open waters without really understanding anything. But I was kind of drove by my desire for freedom to build something without any constraints. But I got tons of constraints, really. Well, you you struggled, and and are there any lessons that not if you could go back and do it over but especially for people who may be at that stage right now where they're just jumping in themselves what advice would you have you know you've learned the hard way from those um early years anything you'd suggest to sort of bypass it if they could well i think the advices are well known uh, nowadays there are really good books about what uh starting i would mention things that shaped uh, later on my thinking it's like uh, four steps to epiphany or lean startup so they understand i think the problem is that they don't incorporate in their thinking it's a big difference between intellectually understanding something and uh, living it with all your fibers for instance fail fast we all know that we need to be really disciplined about it and call call it a day faster than just don't be, just don't try to build the next feature of the product you know living in the illusion the customers will come but i think many entrepreneurs especially the ones coming from engineering backgrounds are doing it so they don't believe in this advice in a way well, it's it's interesting because when I think about the trajectory that you've had, you talk about living it. Let's just step back a second because we we do often talk in these conversations about the thirty thousand foot view and your philosophy. Tactically, I'm intrigued by how you spend your days. You are not somebody who immediately gets up, logs in, and goes to the office in whatever form it takes. Why is that? 
And I, I feel that I need to have time for myself. Mornings are when my brain is the most clear. So I, I want to use it for, I think, things that uh, gives me an advantage. And uh, so to me, reading in the morning, thinking, uh, it's more long-term things. You know, what, what, what I discovered in, uh, in, in my role, so I, I had extremely many hats in, in my life. When I, uh, when I go too much into an operational rhythm, so, you know, all day long, so only meetings over meetings, solving tasks, 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 you lose completely the big picture. After three days of this, I don't know where I am. What is the next task? And for, for a leader of a company, this is going nowhere. You, you really need to elevate yourself and uh, think a bit in advance. Strategy trumps tactics anytime. Well, and you once said uh, you need to be humble to be bold. That's an intriguing concept that a lot of people would think is an oxymoron. What do you mean by that? Well, to me, to, to me being bold have uh, maybe two, two different aspects. You can be bold and rational. You can be bold uh, and arrogant. You can be bold and cocky. So these are, but to me, this is not truly, it's not truly bold. It's more like you live in your own fantasy about yourself. If you are humble and you are grounded into reality, I think this is the only way you can really create bold plans. Bold plans that are anchored in this world, in, in the, in the realm of possible. What, what I find so refreshing, especially when I do these workbench events, talk to people like yourself, is this notion that you don't have to be a titan, first of all, to bring on behemoth customers. I think you had a very creative way of, of doing that. So as a smaller company, how did you woo some of these big players on initially to frankly take a bet on UiPath? I think that, that was uh, the biggest uh, transformation in my life. When I started to talk to more enterprise customers, and I realized that actually they are right and we are wrong in, in the development team. So I, I turn it like really 180 and uh, instead of doing the next uh, big feature, I told to everybody, guys, we listen to them and we do something that they want. And th this is also the type of advice that everybody knows. Everyone will say, yes, we are customer centric, but they don't live customer centric. And it seems like people don't understand that companies are not evaluated by the numbers of features they have in the product. They are evaluated by the numbers of happy customers, the revenue they bring, the stickiness of the revenue. It's a no brainer, but people are not doing it. Get your customer happy, stop your development, fix your customer problem. Forget about the next thing. This is not important. But as you got to this point where your growth suddenly accelerated, you think a lot about culture, you talk about hiring globally, that must have been hard. I mean, just again, I know we're talking strategy, not tactics, but the sheer volume of people that you had to hire the um, the shift, you know, and in, in sort of the the senior talent. Can you just when you reflect back on that, because you did have a stage of extreme growth, then you kind of paused, I think, and talked about efficiency. Now you're on this new path. Walk us through that a little bit, Daniel, as to what the chat, what was it like when all of a sudden these big orders started coming in and you're a relatively small player still in Bucharest? I don't think you you really conceptualized what is on. You you live in the you live in the moment, but your teams are starting to grow. I still remember the days when we have uh, our when we had our town halls and 
we we were still small enough to be in the same room but every time i i came to that room i see you know a third of them were new faces so it was an eerie moment for me and that was kind of the same time when uh, i started to really think about culture because i want i wanted a team that really is aligned and work together. So I, I knew that culture is not my invention, but I knew and I really dialed in, built a company around the culture. But what I think we kind of innovated in uh, how to build the culture of the company was focus. Many companies, when they uh, think about their culture, start with a, a big set of uh, values or behavior, whatever they call it. But that tends to be dilutive. And no, nobody, it, it, it doesn't have the power to align people. So our biggest uh, innovation in how to build culture at scale was starting by this exercise. Let's define our culture by one single value. Mm -hmm. We looked really back into what, what was the thing that put us here? How come, you know, 10 engineers in a small country in Eastern Europe were able to defeat really much larger companies, get to uh, make really large enterprise customer happy? And, you know, wh why we won some of our first deals? really because our competitors were arrogant. Mm. And then I, I really, I wanted to put it in opposition to this. So I said, yes, we have to stay humble. We need humility is our core value. So let's build out of it. So this is why we got to, you, you cannot be humble, but without thinking bold. So you need to be humble and bold and we know that the fastest company is going to win. So we need to be humble, bold, and fast, which are- And, and good. I mean, one of the things obviously that you've done, and this is a question that's actually come in from the audience too, is, you know, you really put RPA, you know, robotic process automation on the map. A lot of big players are now eyeing that space, um, you know, very much seeing you as a competitor as you are. I mean, I'm curious, what, can you tell us a little bit about the future of RP? Maybe start even with the impact of the pandemic. Um, had, did that shift thinking with your customers and how? Well, uh, before the pandemic, we were uh, a pretty kind of uh, remote friendly company. <laughs> this is also an aspect of our company that I am proud of. For instance, everybody in the company, so again, I'm, I, I mean pre-pandemic, uh, was able to work from home with the simple notice in that day, no explanation required, just saying today I'm working from home, that, and that was enough. So we had all the systems really ready for remote work, so we switched very fast to the, to, to the fully remote work. So in turn, we, we were able, even at the beginning of the pandemic, really to look on how can we help some of our customers, particularly in the healthcare uh, uh, space, even in the travel space, they had, you know, mountains of requests piling up. So they resorted to our technology to really deal with this increase in, uh, in volume. But overall, pandemic for us was kind of net neutral. We oh, okay. uh, didn't see, uh, we hit our targets that we said before the pandemic. Some industries went better like uh, healthcare and public sector, others like retail, of course, you know, we've seen uh, downsizing the orders, but now, it seems the wind of, uh, of growth is, uh, is really across all the industries. We, we are all seeing it's, it's an amazing growth opportunity right now. It seems to be less of a specter and a threat. And now that digitization has accelerated, there seems to be more appreciation for what, you, what you've talked about, Daniel, in the past of enabling people 
um, empowerment. I don't know if that's if that's in fact the way you think um, the zeitgeist is and the shift. But certainly, as we look at these big players that are coming in, we've talked about how you brought on big customers. How do you compete against big big established players in terms of the game plan? We have to keep uh, innovating. We have started uh, our uh, journey with a very different approach to automation than anyone else in the industry. We are automating uh, a manual task by emulating the human user. And this is very different than API integrations that, you know, all, whatever other players are doing. And it requires very special, dedicated teams, focus, etc. Now, you know, companies like Microsoft, especially ServiceNow, SAP, IBM, they are getting into the game, but they are just uh, kind of adapting a bit their platforms with a small piece of this. This is not this is not working without really this dedication to it. This is why startups have a chance in this big world because they are the best at what they are doing and not even these big companies can compete with the very focused, dedicated set of people that, uh, you know, that fight for their, their life journey in a way. In Microsoft, they have they have a team, they might be very smart, they might be potentially smarter than us, but we we care more than mm. what we are doing. Why did you decide to go public? There were many options that you would have had. Um, actually, just dial back a little. A lot of people in this audience were maybe at an earlier stage of funding. You famously turned down some pretty big checks early on. Talk about your philosophy of how the company got funded up to the IPO? I always, uh, uh, I, I was always very careful in uh, choosing uh, my investors. I, uh, in every round, absolutely every round, we went more for the quality rather than maximizing the valuation. To me, it's really little uh, importance of the early on valuations. You, you are getting good investors uh, on your cap table means a lot more, means getting more customers, mean greater advice is helping with the chemistry of the team. So it's, uh, it's truly something invaluable. And, and why we went to, for IPO, despite having, uh, I think, close to a billion in the bank at that time, it was, uh, it was particularly because we wanted to offer our employees a good way to cash out, to reward them for their hard work. We went also for uh, the awareness that the public company has. We are in a B2B space and many enterprises prefer to deal with the public company. I think uh, it also helped us bringing more discipline into our uh, operating rhythm and we ipo in a in a good market we we got uh, second best ever you know multiple in the history of ipo so it was a really good opportunity to raise money too any lessons from that that you you take um both from the process of the IPO, but now you're leading a public company, which is a very different beast than, than leading one that's private or investor funded. Um, how has that changed the way you go to market, the way you think about building the business or has it? Well, I start with uh, what, we, what we did well in the, in the IPO. So I, I and uh, our CFO, Ashim, have uh, become really passionate about the process, him especially. But I also, intellectually, it's a very interesting process why the banks build it in that way. And it's a long history to, to understand. And then uh, I discovered that uh, it's very valuable 
talking to investors and analysts. They are seeing lots of companies. They can spot instantly what is good in your go-to-market, what is good in your numbers, KPIs, what is wrong. They give you really good advice. And perfecting our pitch and because of interacting with them helped us even believing even more in our business. We, we came with really great simplified way of presenting our business. It, it was overall a very positive experience, even though very intense. Really, you need to you need to prepare like uh, for competing uh, in a sport event. Well, I mean, was there any great advice that you got? I mean, obviously you said simplified marketing strategy. I don't know if there's anything else in terms of the best advice you got from investors and from a community where we don't normally turn for advice, we just turn for money or maybe and advice. Okay, both. <laughs> well, I think the best advice that we got was uh, to, to still be able to focus long term. Many folks told us, guys, investors, pay attention quarter over quarter, but they pay a lot more attention to the company profile over a long time. You need to, you need to build a durable, sustainable growth business, which is very helpful to see from the people with big checks to, to tell you this. You know, we have a good question coming. So we're now talking about you at a massive size, but it took a while um, to get to, now forgive me, ARR, is that uh, rev, like a million dollars basically? And it was a pivot point, an inflection point at which, you know, UiPath took off like a rocket. Um, and I'm quoting our questioner here on this. Um, there's some curiosity as to like, what did you know? What, when was the moment you knew that, that there was something shifting and that you had to really step on the pedal to, to really maximize the opportunity being presented? Was it a particular customer who came on or particular um, moment in the technology that just clicked? Um, I think it was uh, the vibe of the company. The like vibe? The, the vibe within the company, the energy, the happiness, seeing you know interest mounting all over the place. And uh, I would like to tell you a story that I think it's important for entrepreneurs, how, how, we, how we basically won this race and why we have won at a particular point in time. And that was in 2017. We, we were growing pretty fast. That, that was a fantastic year. We grew from like 5 million in error to 40 million end of the year. But around uh, October, so we were sitting at uh, in our board, and we decided what is the next, what is the plan for the next year. And uh, they told me, Daniel, if you if you double next year, this is phenomenal from our perspective, and it is. But in the same time, I knew we are still number three in the market next year, and I mean 2018 is really the year when this industry it's coming along. So I said, no, we will get to $200 million. This is, this is the way we'll make sure we get to have the number one position and we will get the lion's share of the market. And people really thought that I'm crazy and I'm gonna really break the company. But I, I start to talk to our sales leaders to come with the good frame around how they think about it. We've come with this concept neck on the line. What is the number that you commit? You will be fired if you don't get it. And after this process, we got to, they came to me and say, we are convinced that we will get $250 million in revenue. And I said, that's fine. Let's build capacity to get to 200. If, if you are not getting there, it's still fine. Mm -hmm. But let's make sure that help us to get to 150. And we got to around 170. And we, we've built you know, this ship. And then uh, after that moment, it was unstoppable. 
it's a good strategy. It's interesting. We had a question come in, Daniel, about leadership. It seems like a leader really has three big roles. One is, you know, clearly to set the vision of the company, to choose the senior team and to replace yourself. So I want to touch on all three if we can. Let's start with the vision. When you think about the vision for both UiPath, you know, and, and RPA and such, what do you, what does the world look like? Can you pick whatever time frame, whether it's a year, five years, um, what is the impact that you want your company to have? I think I can answer better by an uh, analogy. Let's, we all know agriculture. We all know how agriculture looked like a hundred years ago and how it does look today. We want to do to the, to the knowledge worker the same transformation that people have seen in agriculture. Throw down our sickles and have like more, more, uh, more automation, more time for the creative work? What, I don't know how farming has changed. Well, so from plowing the fields manually, now if you look at modern farming, they have a control panel where they supervise uh, independent tractors and different uh, machinery that is plowing the field by itself. They have drones that, so it's, a, it's a very different, different type of uh, work and the productivity has increased hundreds of times since a hundred years ago. I, I believe this is the same transformation we are seeing into our the type of work that our knowledge workers are doing. Instead of doing anything manual or repetitive, they will have uh, time to think of, uh, you know, how can I apply my job to the company strategy, which people don't really have time. They will have more time to communicate. To me, this is very understated, but leading teams, having teams, rowing in the same direction is the hardest job on the planet. There is never enough communication. So if people will have time to communicate, to think, to have critical thinking, we will see major shift in how the, the way work is done. So you talk about a hundred year transition in farming. How long is this transition that you envision in the knowledge I, I worker space? That, I think we, we, we've, we have started to see, you know, the early signs of change. And in my opinion, next decade will be, we, we will see quite a lot of changes, the most of them. It's the work in a decade from now on will look very different. So the second part of the question that came in about leadership of um, picking the team, and especially as you know, as UiPath has gotten bigger, you've brought on a mix of people, um, different levels of experience, maturity, not, you know, different parts of the world. How, how do you sort of pick, you know, how do you find excellence in, in the team and how do you continue to sort of uh, bring the culture and inculcate culture when you've got both scale and very different people coming on board as a leader? Well, we are closing the circle of the beginning of the interview. This is where the fiction comes into play. Yeah. Okay. Character study. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you, as, as a team leader, you have to admit that, or at least this is what you should aim for, that you hire people better than you in all of their individual position. So your job is more like a coach. You need to make the team working well together. And uh, people naturally not, it's difficult to find people that really like all of them, each other. We are not friends from childhood. So it's different individualities. They- Do you have to be friends to be effective? I mean, there's certainly a lot of, uh me and my best friend started this company and we're, you know, in it together. And then there's very effective teams that are. I think being friends, uh, it's, uh, can actually hamper the development of the company. Friends don't call so easy the naked truth one to each other. 
and you have to in to me in a team uh, again maybe it's it's a truism but i'm gonna say it trust is the most important thing in in the members of the teams and trust uh, has uh, I, I at least two big coordinates you need to trust their motives and you need to trust their competency if you trust them it's it's very important you can be open so we're getting down to the final part of our conversation and i like um because it does get to the last part of leadership we had a question come in about how did you learn these instincts um, i know you talked about reading this instinct to coaching this interest in leadership and kind of spreading it through the organization is there anything you'd point to as being kind of um an important formative experience that's really shaped how you approach being in this top perch uh absolutely and i think uh what is uh what has become in the last few years, the biggest part of my experience of my change was uh, the mentors that I met in my life. So I, I was really lucky to uh, have access to amazing people, listening to them. And uh, also in the last year, we started to do corporate coaching. So we are working with a great uh, firm and uh, these people also can work with you and th they work with us and the entire leadership team to, to help us with the, you know, the intersection between the cohesion between the members of the, of the teams. This is also, to me, a team, a good team that trust each other, that is aligned, it's extremely dangerous for any competitor. That's very good advice, I think. I mean, do you, um, I did mention not replacing yourself because I don't think you're going anywhere, um, but when you think about building a bench and building bench strength, obviously you mentor a lot of people, I'm sure in the company. Um, tactically, strategically, do you have any advice? Because the hardest thing to do in every company is to replace yourself, no matter how big, how successful. How do you think about that? If you were to be, um, you know, whacked by a bus tomorrow, would UI path be fine? Nowadays, uh, yes, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be fine. Maybe a few years ago, it would have been more challenging. I I, I know this is uh, this is one of the biggest mistakes that leaders are doing: not uh, not build uh, a successors, not creating a really good successor. And it's, certainly, it's uh, it's something that. Uh, I have in mind. I still feel that I have some uh, something left in the tank. Of course, but no. It's it's the implications that you're leaving. It's more just that we don't tend to think about it until somebody's like, you know. I I agree with you. It's uh, it it's uh, it's becoming uh, you know an important part of my current thinking. Do you use? Final point: Do you use UI Path? Has it been? In, is it? Has your own technology been helpful to you as a leader as you're making these sort of human choices and priorities yourself? Um, maybe a good way to end is just sort of how we should be thinking about automation right. and how it helps us do our job, our jobs better. We in UI Path we are using it uh, extensively. We have put recently a blog post about our internal center of excellence. It's a, it's a good read for everybody here. But so we are a company of uh, 3000 people and we have saved more than 3000 hundreds hours of manual work in, for this size. So, wow. 300,000 hours. That's incredible. Um, I think this is terrific. So thank you for your time, Daniel. I think we could speak with you all evening in the case of the UK. And I know you're in uh, Romania tonight. So thank you for taking the time and, and here in New York as well. So it's been terrific. I really appreciate it. And uh, I will turn it over to you, Kira. Thank, yes, thank you so, so much, um, Daniel and Diane. It's been great hearing you speak, Daniel. Um, you know, we always love hearing leaders <laughs> and their, their journeys to success. 
Um, but for everyone else on the call, if you're interested in any playbooks um, or any other events, feel free to sign up for our Enterprise Weekly Newsletter on our website. Um, we host a bunch of these um, throughout the year, about once a month. Um, and Ian is going to drop a link in the chat for the after party. So if you have time, feel free to stop by there. But thank you everyone for coming and we hope to see you at the next one.